Good morning, everybody, and welcome. After a great first day of the conference, welcome to the second day. Uh, we have much in store today. So we have the third invited paper session, which is this one. We have a policy panel coming up, the Young Economist session we are looking forward to, yet another Nobel Prize keynote lecture. And as I heard, the supply bottlenecks at lunchtime have been alleviated. So we look forward to meeting you also there. So this is session three on monetary policy and financial markets. So we have a pleasure to have two of the most popular academics, in the, especially in the yield curve community, and I would say also especially in the central bank yield curve community, and clearly way beyond. So we have Dimitri Vajanos of London School of Economics. He had the seminal work on integrating the supply-demand view of, of bond pricing with the asset pricing view. So we owe him a lot in, in our field, and a lot of central bank models are based on what he has done with co-authors. And we have Cynthia Wu of University of Notre Dame with similar impact on what we do. I mean, many of you may know her for the work on shadow rates, but she has done way beyond uh, that, that uh, field of research. We have discussions. We have Andrea Vladu from the European Central Bank, from the Monetary Policy Department, and Stéphane Dupras from Banque de France, also from the Monetary Policy Department. So I'm happy to have this impressive lineup here for this session. Uh, I think we have to stay in time because the policy panel is shortly afterwards this one. So um, without further ado, Dimitri, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang, for this very kind introduction. And thank you, uh, you and the organizing committee for uh, including our paper in the conference. So this is a joint work with uh, uh, Pierre-Olivier Gourenchat uh, and um, Walker Ray. OK. OK, so just to motivate, in general, kind of the question we can have in mind is uh, how does monetary policy, whether it's conventional or unconventional, transmit um, domestically and inter internationally? Now, <clears throat> if we think in terms of the standard <coughs> open economy macro model, the um, answer is kind of, are, are kind of very clear and simple. First of all, um, the expectations hypothesis of the term structure uh, holds up to constant risk premia, uh, constant over time. Same for uh, uncovered interest parity. <coughs> and as a result, Expectations hypothesis implies that uh, the yield curve in each country is determined fully by current and future expected short rates. UIP implies that the exchange rate absorbs any dev deviations between short rates. So there is this kind of, it insulates one country's um, yield curve uh, from movements in the other country's uh, short rate and yield curve. <coughs> and finally, quantity type of interventions like a QE or um, 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 foreign exchange interventions have no effect. Now, this uh, kind of simplified view of um, um, bond prices and exchange rates has some um, um, problems. So first of all, on the finance side, there are some important violations of expectations hypothesis and uh, UIP. So, um, <coughs> and some important kind of predictability patterns or anomaly kind of pattern, financial anomaly patterns. So it has been documented uh, extensively since uh, Bilson and Fama that uh, the currency carry trade is profitable. So borrowing low interest rate currencies and investing in higher interest rate currencies is uh, on average uh, yields uh, abnormal, abnormally high return. <laughs> then, so the high interest rate currencies do not depreciate enough to cover the difference in interest rates and sometimes even appreciate on average. Then uh, expectations hypothesis is also violated in important ways. So starting with the work of, of the work of Fama and Bliss and Campbell and Schiller, it has been documented that the slope of the term structure predicts positively excess bond returns. So times when the term structure is upward sloping or is significantly upward sloping, long-term bonds on average do better than short-term bonds and vice versa. Long-term bonds do worse than short-term bonds when the term structure is downward sloping. So this is the... Essentially, the bond carry trade is profitable, borrowing on the segment of the term structure at where rates are, rates are low and investing on the, on the other segment where rates are high, yields are high, is profitable. <laughs> Moreover, there is a more interesting kind of a body of work that shows that there are this, some inter interesting connections between uh, pre risk premium and bond and currency markets. For example, um, people have shown that the um, differential between term structure slopes in, the, in two countries is predictive 
of the um, um, of the profitability of the of the currency carry trade <coughs> and um, and finally on kind of if we go leave the finance uh, world and go to the macro world <coughs> we have kind of it has been documented that QE has been having an effect both domestically and also internationally so QE affects the uh, um, domestic bond yields but also affects exchange rate and affects even foreign bond yields <coughs> so we will try to propose a different view of um, kind of this um, um, kind of international uh, uh, macro that um, or let's say for now international finance primarily <coughs> there's macro element is very limited in the model that I will show you that um, tries to address some of these phenomena kind of things so <coughs> we're going to um, uh, pro uh, I will show you a two country model with a partially segmented bond markets and currency markets so there will be some investor clientels in each market and there, was th there is this uh, <coughs> um, some integration that is going to be achieved in a partial manner by risk averse arbitrageurs so essentially we're going to distinguish between kind of the outside of the financial market and the core of the financial markets that are these arbitrageurs and um, uh, okay so um, <clears throat> and these arbitrageurs can be different types of financial institutions. So uh, broker dealers can be hedge funds that are somehow they, through their activities they integrate markets but do so partially because of capital, risk aversion, capital constraints, etc. <clears throat> so the main results are first of all we're going to speak to the predictability patterns of bond and currency returns. We're going to show that, that this view of, uh, of markets can generate realistic predictions for the predictability of returns and speak to these finance puzzles. And at the same time, we're going to show that um, the implications for monetary policy are quite different than those of the standard model. So the open economy, let's say New Keynesian uh, macro model. <coughs> so QE, we are going to show that it transmits, um, uh, so QE, purchase, QE purchases lower domestic bond yields they also transmit internationally to foreign bond yields. They also lower foreign bond yields and they depreciate the exchange rate. Conventional policy is also transmitted to foreign bond yields, although we find quantitatively that the transmission is weaker than for QE. And uh, more broadly, uh, I mean, the, the message from these two kind of results is that uh, uh, floating exchange rates provide limited insulation. So monetary um, uh, policy at home, whether conventional or unconventional, affects yields at foreign. And I should emphasize, affects yields at foreign, holding foreign monetary policy constant. Maybe monetary policy also can, foreign monetary policy can change in response to uh, home policy. We're not going to speak to that. But we're saying that even if it does not change, there are these spillover effects. Okay, so, so that's the summary of the paper. And uh, now let me go through the model. <coughs> and okay, so the model is um, built on my earlier work with Villa <coughs> on the, for a closed economy kind of term structure. So, and, be, and extend this to, to uh, two countries. So there are two countries, home and foreign. <coughs> there is a, we call the nominal exchange rate by ET. So is the home price of foreign currency. So when ET goes up, means the foreign currency appreciates. <coughs> then um, there is a, a continuum of zero coupon bonds in each country. And um, the, um, we, did, we call the bond price in country J at time T uh, for maturity tau by PJT tau. We define the yield to maturity in the standard way. <coughs> And uh, we take the short rate, quite importantly, as exogenous. So the short rate is the limit of these yields when maturity goes to zero, tau goes to zero. We take this as exogenous and uh, specify some process for that that can be the result of conventional monetary policy. So <coughs> there are, as I announced earlier, <coughs> there will be two types of traders in the model. There will be arbitrageurs and there will be these clientels of investors in different markets. So the, the more somehow sophisticated and interesting agents in the model will be the arbitrageurs. We will take a more reduced form in modeling the, the investor clientels. So arbitrageurs have some wealth WT. We use the home currency as the numeraire. They um, invest endogenously some wealth WFT, some part of their wealth WT in, the, in country F. 
so they can be either in the in the cash, I mean in, in the in the in um, the foreign country's currency, or can be in foreign country bonds. And um, they also invest some wealth in um, bonds in each country. So, ex so for the amount of wealth that are invested in foreign bonds is included in WFT. But we call it for ma for f f um, foreign bonds with maturity tau. We call it XFT tau. Okay. Uh, we give them a very simple objective. They are rational. They maximize this mean variance preference over instantaneous changes in wealth. And this is the law of motion that um, is important to understand. It's very, in some sense, it's very simple conceptually. It kind of it has a bit of continuous time stuff. But the, um, the ideas that arbitrageurs get this kind of basic, let's say, default kind of rate, W, um, uh, sorry, I, uh, the home short rate on their wealth. And then they can get some extras, which reflect the returns of the three trades that they can perform in a kind of uh, in addition to this basic rate which okay first of all they can in um, the, the currency carry trade so they can invest some of their wealth in foreign and get the interest rate differential between home and foreign and of course there is also the exchange rate appreciation then so that's the currency carry trade this is the home bond carry trade so they can invest some amount XHT in home bonds, and they get whatever these bonds yield in excess of the short rate, <laughs> of the home short rate. And they can also invest in um, foreign uh, bonds. And again, they, they are going to get whatever these bonds yield <laughs> in excess of the uh, foreign short rate. All right. So, and then, so that's one class of agents. And of, obviously, arbitrageurs are going to optimize over this, they will choose this WFT and this XHT and this XFT optimally given, kind of opportunistically, given how high the returns of these trades are. <laughs> and the returns of these trades are going to be endogenously depending on how much arbitrageurs are investing in them. This will be kind of, they will be determined in equilibrium. Okay, and then there will be some, these client, investor clientels, we call them preferred habitat investors and bond investors and currency traders. <coughs> we'll take a more reduced form approach for them. So, um, so we, we will assume that um, the, um, there is some demand for bonds in country J in maturity tau. That is a downward sloping function of price. That, um, so essentially the demand for, this, for bonds with maturity tau depends on, on this negatively on the bonds price. Also, we're going to put a demand shifter, this beta JT, this beta here. So this will be a demand factor we allow the demand for bonds to be shocked kind of for exogenous reasons to the model. And also there is a demand like, likewise for foreign currency that um, we allow it again to be a decreasing function of um, the exchange rate. In fact, we allow it to depend on the real, ex to, de to be decreasing in the real exchange rate. We, allow, we introduce kind of in an exogenous kind of form inflation in each country and we allow it to, uh, that is constant over time, we allow kind of, we essentially specify the demand to be for currency to be a decreasing function of the real exchange rate. And we also inc inc have a, this gamma T, which is a shock to the demand for, for currency. For, <coughs> okay. So, so this, is the, this is essentially the model. That's it. These are the two set of agents. And um, given the interaction between these agents, we're going to determine prices, the exchange rate and bond prices. So market's clear. We have, we assume that bonds are in zero supply. This is not, this is without loss of generality because we can put any kind of positive supply into the demand of preferred habitat investors. We can call it a net demand. <laughs> so demand of arbitrageurs for home bonds plus demand of preferred habitat investors is zero. Same thing for foreign bonds, same thing for currency. Okay, so um, now, we're going to start, uh, uh, last thing, uh, before kind of closing the models, have some notation. So we're ha we have five risk factors. We have short rates, two short rates, one in each country. We have bond demand factors, this intercepts in the demand functions, and we have currency demand factor. So we allow, in principle, these factors to follow some mean reverting dynamics. So these factors are all exogenous in the model. And um, there are these matrices, gamma and sigma, five, these five by five matrices. <coughs> that um, um, in the last part of the paper where we do a calibration of the model, we'll try to get a handle of how we can 
quantify the elements of these matrices. For now, just general. All right. So we'll start with simple cases and progressively kind of enrich the model. So first of all, what happens when arbitrage sorcery is neutral? Then we're back in the, let's say, the classical model. So the um, expectations hypothesis holds. Expected return of bonds is going to be equal to the short rate. So bonds don't offer any superior returns to relative to the short rate. <coughs> and um, obviously, there will not be any QE um, on the yield curve. And also, the, the yield curve in every country will be independent of shocks to the foreign short rate, I mean, to the short rates in the other country, as long as these shocks do not affect future expected short rates in the country in question. OK. Then um, also UIP is going to hold. And um, this will give us the, the Mandelian kind of insulation. Shocks to uh, uh, short rate, sho shocks to um, uh, short rate in one country do not affect, that does not affect the term structure in the other country. Okay. Now, let's now um, make arbitrageurs back risk averse. So, to get kind of our main results. And, uh, but let's keep the simplify the model in some other way. Let's get rid of demand shocks in um, bonds and in currency. So the only shocks are going to be shocks to the short rates, home and foreign. We take the short rates for simplicity to be independent and specify these simple processes, these simple AR1 processes for the short rates. I mean, this mean reverting processes. <laughs> so this is a case where we can get lots of analytical results and kind of in full generality. So... Um, OK, let us start with um, um, kind of a, um, the case where arbitrageurs, arbitrageurs are segmented. Even ar not only the bond and investors and currency investors are segmented, but even arbitrageurs. Let's break our arbitrageurs into some arbitrageurs who trade bonds, some arbitrageurs who trade currencies, just for, um, to get a handle kind of <coughs> on the additional effects that, that will um, the cross-trading of arbitrageurs in different instruments will generate. Let's first of all assume that arbitrageurs cannot do this cross-trading. Some arbitrageurs just trade home bonds and just do arbitrage across the home term structure and vice versa for foreign and vice versa for currency. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> these are, the, I will show you two basic results in this model, in this segmented kind of arbitrage model. So first of all, on the exchange rate, so the exchange rate kind of underreacts to shocks to uh, to short rate shocks, and um, what this means, the flip side of this result, is that uh, the currency carry trade is profitable. So when, for example, uh, there is an increase in the foreign short rate, the expected return of the currency carry trade uh, increases. In other words, it becomes more profitable to invest in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the foreign currency. So the intuition here builds on uh, uh, Gabex and Maggiore, and also dating back to Curry, that is, is as follows. <coughs> Suppose that the, there is an increase in the foreign short rate, so monetary tightening, uh, tightening at foreign. Then arbitrageurs, in principle, they want to invest more in the currency carry trade. They want to borrow from home and invest in foreign, because they see, OK, foreign short rate uh, has gone up, so we want to pocket this short trade differential. Now, as a result of their pressure, of their uh, uh, buying pressure, they want to buy foreign currency to invest at foreign, foreign currency is going to appreciate. <laughs> as a result, because foreign currency appreciates, what happens in equilibrium? The currency traders reduce their holdings of foreign currency because now foreign currency is more expensive. Arbitrageurs find themselves holding more foreign currency and to be induced to buy to hold more foreign currency, well, um, the currency carry trade has to yield a higher expected return in equilibrium. That's the only, that's the only kind of um, way for arbitrageurs in equilibrium to be bearing more currency carry trade risk. The, the expected return of the currency carry trade has to go up. <laughs> okay, so result number one. Result number two, there is a counterpart of this in, for the bond market. <coughs> so foreign, sorry, um, let's say yields in uh, bond yields in country J, home or foreign, um, underreact relative to the expectations hypothesis to shocks to the short rate in that country. So um, 
And as a, as a result, the um, um, profitability of the bond car, uh, carry trade uh, decreases in the home short rate. So let me explain. So this in the intuition here builds on my paper with Villa. So let's say that the home short rate goes down. So monetary um, loosening at home. What's going to happen? Now arbitrageurs are going to find advantages to borrow short and invest in long-term bonds. So this will push um, prices of long-term bonds up. This will, um, uh, as a result, the, these habitat investors are going to hold less of these bonds because the prices of these bonds have gone up. They, don't, they, they have this price elastic demand. They don't want to hold many bonds if bonds become more expensive. Arbitrageurs will find themselves holding more bonds. Therefore, bonds have to have a higher um, offer to ha have to have to offer a higher uh, expected excess return relative to the short rate. So this means that um, the current the bond carry trade becomes more profitable. Borrowing short investing in long term bonds becomes more profitable. It also means that bond yields underreact to the um, to the, um, um, to, the, to the short rate. So bond yields do not go down as much as the expectations hypothesis would say. And um, what the, okay, so additional implications. There are some quantity implications from the, from the segmented arbitrage model. <coughs> so quantity changes have effects, but only in the market where they happen. So QE um, in country J reduces yields in country J, does not affect the exchange rate, does not affect uh, the other country. <coughs> and same thing for currency interventions. So, <coughs> so essentially, we get some insulation results. So changes in the monetary conditions at home do not affect foreign. So it's a full insulation, but this full insulation happens because of segmented arbitrage, not because of, um, because of, of, of segmented capital markets, in a sense, not because of, um, um, kind of, of um, the standard kind of reason why uh, of, of these floating exchange rates. So now, let's, now that we got this kind of simple case um, uh, under our belt, let's go to the to the case that we're focusing on in the paper, which is arbitrageurs now can trade all the different instruments, all bonds and currencies, and uh, how they're going to manage this portfolio and kind of uh, trade, trade off these different types of risk will affect the spillover, will determine the spillover effects. All right. <coughs> so our main results are in this slide and in the next slide. So what we show, so, um, um, let's say when home short trade goes down, then, okay, as we have already seen, currency carry trade becomes more profitable. It becomes more profitable to invest in the foreign currency. It also becomes more profitable to, to do the bond carry, carry trade at home. <laughs> Moreover, the new element is that um, a reduction in the home short trade pushes even foreign bond prices up and reduces the profitability of the foreign bond carry trade. <coughs> so there is this transmission of uh, monetary conditions at home to foreign, even holding the short rate at foreign constant and the path of expected future short rates constant. So what's the intuition here? This has to do with the essentially cross-currency um, hedging by arbitrageurs. So, okay, home short rate goes down, arbitrageurs are investing, hold now in equilibrium more currency foreign currency and more home bonds. Now, arbitrageurs, by holding more foreign currency, now they find themselves exposed, not only to home short rate risk, which they demand the compensation for, but also to foreign short rate risk. <coughs> so they are exposed in particular to the risk that the foreign short rate will go down because this will reduce the value of their currency holdings. What do they do to hedge that risk? They, a good way to hedge that risk is to buy foreign bonds because foreign bonds go up when foreign short rates go down. So as a result of this, uh, pr this trade generates, this hedging trade generates price pressure, <laughs> causes uh, bond prices at foreign to increase, and um, the um, um, profitability of the, bond, of the foreign bond carry trade to uh, decline. Okay, number one. Now let's follow this logic of this hedging of by, by arbitrage, this kind of uh, um, global hedging. <laughs> and let's see what this implies for quantity interventions. So now let's say that there is, okay, so QE um, at home, country J, home. So the, um, this, okay, QE at home is going to um, cause 
the um, home currency to depreciate and is going to also uh, not only cause bond yields at home to go down, but also bond yields at foreign to go down, will transmit itself to the, to the foreign bond market as well. <laughs> so why is that? To arbitrageurs are going to accommodate um, QE by, let's say, in the extreme case, going short bonds. I mean, they're going to reduce their position in, in, in home bonds. So now, the... Um, Okay, now, now arbitrageurs are short in home bonds, means that they, have a, they are exposed to the risk that home short rates are going to um, uh, decline. Because if home short rates are going to decline, they are short po the bonds are going to, home bonds are going to become more expensive, they are going to lose on their short positions. So what, pos what trade hedges the risk that home short rates decline? Well, to go long in foreign currency. Because foreign currency goes up when short appreci appreciates when sh uh, home short rates decline. Okay, so, arbitrage, so they buy foreign currency, foreign, um, so foreign currency appreciates, so domestic currency depreciates. Moreover, we have already seen from the previous slide that when, that the, when they have a position in the foreign currency, they hedge this by buying foreign bonds. They hedge the foreign short trade risk by buying foreign bonds. So bottom line, QE at home causes um, foreign, currency to, foreign currency to appreciate and uh, raise and lowers uh, foreign um, bond yields, not only bond yields at home. Same logic <coughs> the, about the uh, in, uh, intervention in the currency market. If, let's say, there is a um, um, purchase of foreign currency, then, um, okay, the foreign currency, of course, will appreciate, but also um, bond yields at home are going to um, decline and yields at foreign are going to go up. And the logic is essentially the same as, uh, as the hedging logic that we, I explained in the context of QE. Um, if arbitrageurs uh, hold a smaller position in foreign currency, let's say they go, they, then they, they hedge this position, they, they, they hedge, let's say, a short position in foreign currency, they hedge this position by buying home bonds. It's the kind of the, lo the same similar logic with the hedging of the, for the QE. Okay, so <coughs> the implications for uh, open economy macro is that so, home, so the, the, essentially the spillover result, conventional or unconventional policy um, spills, uh, um, affects yield curves in both countries, holding um, 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 monetary conditions at foreign the same. And um, so, and there is this imperfect insulation results, even though exchange rates are floating there is uh, kind of the standard kind of uh, installation results, fa the standard trilemma fails. Okay, so that's, these are, let's say, the main, our main results that we show analytically. Now, we can, I can tell you a bit more about kind of a con our attempt to quantify the model in the remaining of my time. So, <coughs> remember we have this monster five-factor uh, model that um, we have, all, we have this, um, in addition to the two short rates, we can have these shocks to the demand for uh, bonds and currency. So, um, okay, so the model still has a simple kind of affine solution for bond yields and, and, and for currency. So we can essentially adopt some simple parametric forms for the demand of habitat, of bond, uh, of um, preferred habitat investors in the bond market and for currency traders. We also need to parameterize, to, to make some parameter choices about all these gamma and sigma matrices all these um, spillover kind of effects of the, of the factors. So we try to make, take a minimal structure, don't, don't, not kind of choose too many parameters different from zero. Essentially, we will uh, choose this matrix gamma to be diagonal um, the, for the dynamics of the factors, except for one um, um, term that is going to, the data tells us that it should be there, which is as feedback from a, um, how shocks to, inter to interest rates affect demand for currency. Somehow that we're going to allow for that. And then we're going to take also sigma, the shocks to be diagonal, except for the correlation between home and foreign short rate, which um, the, um, uh, the data tells us that is there, is positive and quite significant. So this is for, um, we, do, we calibrate between the uh, US and the Euro area. <coughs> okay, so um, we use a bunch of moments of um, yields and the exchange rate changes, so second moment. So um, variance of yields, variance of yield changes, uh, variance of yield differentials between home and foreign. For, we do this for, short, for the one year yield, which we take to be the short rate. We also do this for 
um, the entire term, uh, term structure. We have um, variance of exchange rate changes. We have the UIP moments, essentially um, the, um, re the um, regression coefficient of the, um, yield of the yield differential between the two countries on the exchange rate changes. We have some moments on trading volume. So, and we try to minimize the distance between the model generated parameters and the parameters that are in the data, uh, the, I mean, the moments in the data. So, um, the, um, okay. So, the, we, of course, we have to fit many more uh, moments in the data than the, there are parameters in the model. We get a decent fit, not perfect, but decent. So, here we, you can see the um, variance of yield changes at home and foreign, the, um, the variance of uh, yields, the um, kind of some covariances between the um, um, yield changes for one year and for uh, kind of any, any maturity. Anyway, so there, it, it's not that far. And then what we try to, we get the model to try to match some untargeted moments. <laughs> so that's the first uh, step. Then we'll, I will tell you, talk a bit about monetary policy. Some untargeted moments, which are, first of all, the predictability of in the bond market. Essentially, the, bond, the, the relationship between the profitability of the bond carry trade and the slope of the term structure. So this is the result from Fama and Bliss that are in the, in the top um, 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 row. And then also the related results from Campbell and Schiller. Essentially, both papers do a similar regression, kind of <laughs> just in different form. So essentially, we find that there is this, um, um, as, as our model predicts, we find that the, um, uh, sorry, and as is the case in the data, that um, w we find that um, the, um, when the, I mean, that the slope of the term structure is positively related to excess return of long-term bonds relative to short-term bonds. Not, the, the data tells us something that we don't find in the model, that this coefficient of the predictability is, uh, increases with maturity, we find kind of fairly flat. Um, but anyway, but at least this, reasonably strong and within the bounds of the data. Then on the, um, on the currency market, okay, so we generate the UIP um, violations as in the data. Okay, we have put some moments on the UIP in the calibration. So, um, so in some sense we have, uh, this is not completely untargeted. However, we also generate this interesting um, predictability pattern that I mentioned in the introduction, which is that the slope differential between the two countries um, is predictive of the excess return of the currency carry trade. And this is the last uh, um, bottom uh, right um, graph, which is untargeted. So <clears throat> now, let's now talk about policy spillovers and then I will conclude. So what we do is we, do a, um, we look at the shock to conventional policy, and um, which is an unanticipated one-off 25 basis point decrease in the short rate with a half-life of one year, so fairly quickly mean reverting. And also we do a QE shock, that is 10% of GDP, um, po a positive demand shock for bonds, and this is more slowly mean reverting. <coughs> so, so here are the results from the calibration. So, the, um, so we find that, okay, even though theoretically there is, a there is a spillover from conventional policy to foreign bond yields, holding again foreign, um, for, um, uh, from, um, spillover from home um, short rate movements to foreign yields. So holding foreign monetary policy constant, we find that this spillover is small. So um, uh, this is the, this, uh, the so essentially the, essentially it's almost non-existent. Um, obviously the term structure, let's say the top curve is the shock to the home short rate, um, uh, affects the term structure at home, that's the blue curve. And, but the foreign uh, term structure barely moves. Now, this is partially due to the fact that we find a small demand elasticity for currency, which matters for the spillover, but also partially because we find that, uh, partially because of the correlation that we estimate in the data between short rates. So this hedging effect that generates the spillover is not as strong. Now, we find, on the other hand, bigger spillovers for QE. <laughs> Essentially, the effects on, uh, of QE at home and foreign are of roughly or same order of magnitude. And, um, and also they're significant also even for the exchange rate. And why there are the effects of, of QE spillovers are significant? Partially because of the correlation between um, home and short rates, home and foreign short rates are positively correlated. And 
therefore, um, kind of uh, portfolio changes of uh, changes to the composition of arbitrageurs portfolio, uh, let's say, of home bonds can have a significant effect on, home, on foreign bonds which are correlated. Okay, so let me conclude. <coughs> um, so we present an integrated framework to understand term premium and current series, kind of emphasizing their interrelationships. So we saw that um, um, this framework can help us to make sense to some extent of the predictability patterns in um, bond and currency markets. And the flip side of the same coin is that these predictability patterns also relate to the transmission of monetary policy. So, the, um, uh, so we find that um, monetary policy transmits, uh, whether conventional or un unconventional, transmits internationally through precisely the same changes in risk premium that we find that um, kind of matter for these predictability patterns. So <coughs> now, there are two extensions that um, I wish I, I, uh, I could tell you more, but still kind of is work in progress. One is to consider deviations from covered interest parity. In this model, covered interest parity holds. Um, so, but um, if arbitrage with more severe kind of constraints on arbitrageurs, we could find violations of covered parity, interest parity. And the other kind of big extension, and this is where we have made quite a bit of progress, but is still not at a presentable stage, is to embed this um, setting into a new Keynesian open economy model and to derive many of these things that I, we took as exogenous in this model, like um, short rates or like these demands of uh, currency traders and uh, preferred habitat investors, derive them for first primitives. I guess Cynthia will tell you more about this, such, such, such an effort in, the, in a closed economy model. But uh, anyway, so this is our next uh, agenda. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dimitri. Very clear presentation, spot on timing also, by the way. And Andrea, please. And you can think of your questions also online, please. So I will receive them. And if you online participants uh, have questions, uh, let us know via WebEx, please. But no, OK. So I'm honored to, to discuss the paper by Dimitri, Pierre Olivier, and, and Ray. Uh, thank you very, very much to the organizer for the occasion. And the usual disclaimer um, applies. So um, I must refill from the beginning. I find the paper seminal um, in great part because it also extends the uh, paper by uh, <laughs> the previous paper by Dimitri and Villa to an international micro setup. And um, for those of you who are uh, still young in, in the room, uh, this paper um, has actually laid the theoretical foundation of the interplay between uh, preferred habitat uh, investors and arbitrageurs. In, um, in explaining bond markets. And that has um, allowed us to understand um, in, like why is QE working uh, in practice and how does it um, work? And I got to know actually that the paper was written before QE was actually uh, started after the great financial crisis. So in the current model that um, Dimitri presented today, the arbitrageurs um, go globally. So um, they are allowed to invest in, in foreign currency and in foreign bonds. Um, and they are risk averse. That's very important. Uh, they maximize the mean variance utility objective function. Um, the second clientele in, in the model are preferred habitat um, investors, both currency, uh, because, for example, of economical reasons, exporters, importers, or bond traders, either in the long end of the curve, like pension funds, or in the short end, like money market funds. So um, the two interact, and in equilibrium, um, the ex in partial equilibrium, exchange rates and, um, and yields are functions of five state variables, the short rates, um, of um, in the domestic and in the uh, currency. These are exo exogenous, but I understand that uh, there is work in that uh, direction of um, making integrating macro and the foreign currency demand factor and two bond demand factors. Um, and the key ingredient of the model is the risk aversion of, of arbitrageurs. And that allows to um, the model to capture the empirically um, violated like, evidence for the empirical violated expectation hypothesis. So yields, um, uh, the, the yield curve does not reflect just uh, future expected short rates, but also term premia, as well as the uncovered interest rate parity, which has also empirically been shown to, to be violated, namely that um, differentials in short rate are not, um, uh, I mean, the exchange rate reflects something more than just the differential between the short rates. So um, the main findings are um, domestic, conventional, 
uh, monetary policy does not impact the foreign yield curve or de facto, so it's a very tiny impact. Um, unconventional monetary policy, however, has a sizable impact, both uh, at home and similar to a similar extent, I would say, also on, on the foreign yield curve. And the third um, um, finding is that spillovers from both conventional and unconventional monetary policy are very strong on the exchange rate and comparable uh, across the two types of, of, um, of policy. So um, in today's discussion, um, I uh, will bring a bit of um, empirical implications, I will cross-check the empirical implications of the model across more um, um, parsimonious, non-structural uh, term structure models, high frequency identifications or uh, VAR models. So. Uh, let me um, uh, re replicate. So the first chart is uh, showing the, the impact of conventional monetary policy uh, from the model on uh, the current and the, the foreign uh, yield curves. And um, as you see, the reaction in the non-originated country is, is low. So I, um, I raise the question, uh, is this something that is, for example, in line to what we have seen, what we are seeing in the current easing, uh, sorry, in the current hiking uh, cycle? Um, is it, uh, for example, reasonable to expect no um, impact of US um, uh, hike expectations and then, uh, on, on the euro area yield? And for that, I um, uh, used, so one empirical evidence comes uh, from, a, from a model by uh, Brandt et al. Um, who are uh, estimating a sign restricted BVAR. And you see, they, and here is plotted a decomposition, a historical decomposition of the 10 year OIS rate into euro area policy, uh, US policy, and euro area macro and other, and uh, US macro. And you see that the green part, which is showing the US policy impact, on the change um, of the 10-year um, OS, so risk-free euro area rate, is significant. Now, this uh, actually captures um, both conventional and unconventional monetary policy in the US, but I would think it's um, tentative evidence that also conventional monetary policy would spill over to, to euro area. So, um, you, um, Dimitri mentioned there is um, some empirical um, um, influence of the correlation between the two short rates. Has that maybe have changed over time with uh, the economy turning more global and that could maybe, let's say, speak to or suggest that currently there are uh, stronger uh, spillovers from domestic, which is US, and that is actually a second point. Is there something um, that, given that US is documented to have uh, to play a very large role in, in the economy, like a global currency, could that maybe uh, be twisted, so like an asymmetric uh, spillover from domestic US currency, uh, conventional monetary policy to, for example, euro area, like smaller economies? So maybe this, um, uh, this first empirical finding could be... Um, tested uh, differently, so it could be empirically different. Um, then, um, let me turn to uh, the impact uh, of a rate cut, so conventional monetary policy on, on the yield curve. Um, Dimitri explained that the, um, upon a policy rate cut, bond yields do not, do not drop all the way to the value implied by the expectation uh, hypothesis. And this is something that, for example, one, one US paper uh, that also uh, looks into a term structure model, Abraham and I'll also uh, confirm. That would mean that, um, so term premia tend to increase upon rate cuts. Um, and then I thought of, okay, so uh, how do things look like in the, in the euro area? And in the euro area, we find, uh, there's a model that, uh, by, um, by Geiger and Schupp that actually find that um, when accounting also for the lower bound, and I'll get to that, uh, a rate cut is actually estimated to, to lower uh, the expectation component, but also the term premium. So um, I would, I mean, um, it's not an additional thing, but um, when you show, um, so when you have here, like the, the blue line or the red, like the big, uh, the big reaction, how about decomposing? How much is the expectation component uh, behind the curve and how much is uh, the reaction of the term premium such that we would be, I think, um, we, would be, we would like to know where is the ratio of the two components, um, how is the ratio of the two components going uh, across the curve? And um, another point, 
uh, we, we tend to think that um, easing, like the, the previous uh, easing cycle, uh, was associated with lower, even negative premia. Um, and uh, the current hiking cycle, in the current hiking cycle, term premia tends to generally increase um, and, and turn positive if they maybe have, uh, were uh, negative. So I know that you mentioned in the paper that there is, um, you don't want to talk about unconditional moments and uh, it's all about the reaction, but I, I think it would be informative for, for uh, the literature to also mention be like science and um, uh, um, of premia in, um, in various hiking or easing cycles. Uh, last thing here, uh, maybe you can uh, discuss um, whether there can be there's scope for implementing an asymmetric um, impact of easing versus tightening cycles. So if this can some is if there is a channel in the model that could allow to to explain this possible asymmetry. Now um, a smaller point relates to the um, to the impact of of estimating the data on a sample that basically covers also uh, the low interest rates period or even um, negative interest rates in the euro area. And that by now has turned to be a, a third, to cover a third of the sample that you use in the estimation. So um, I would find it interesting if the authors would um, comment on what is the caveat of not accounting for the, for the lower bound. Because um, in the, um, paper by, by Xintia, previous paper by Xintia and, and Dora, um, you see here the, um, the, uh, there's a slight difference in the impact of conventional monetary policy on the short rate, and um, I think that that's uh, worth uh, a bit discussing. Whereas, um, so the impact in the lower bound period in the, in the US, according to the, to the paper by, uh, by Xintia, is found to be smaller. However, in the euro area, because uh, we, um, there, uh, there was the, the negative interest rate policies, uh, the reaction in the, second, in the lower panel, uh, which shows um, the impact of a um, uh, 10 basis points rate cut uh, on, on, the, on the yield curve is actually found to be um, similar, if not slightly larger. In the, non, in the negative interest rate uh, policy period. And for example, one channel that, is, um, that could explain that is the seek for yield uh, channel. So maybe the lower, not accounting for the lower bound plays a smaller role in the euro area than in the, in the US, but I think it's, it's a point uh, worth discussing. And um, you also mentioned that there is the uh, nominal and real version of the model, so maybe one way to go about it would be to calibrate the model on, on real yield curves. So next, moving to the impact of unconventional monetary policy on the domestic and foreign yield curve, the impacts are, are uh, sizable and, and large. And uh, the authors do a good job in explaining the sensitivity of uh, these uh, spillovers um, and Im impact on the risk aversion parameter. So the smaller the, the risk aversion, the smaller also the, the relative impact on the, on the non-originating country. Uh, the correlation of the short rates also here plays a role, as well as the elasticity demand of, uh, of currency traders and um, the way that is calibrated. But there are, I think that there are a few other points uh, that are um, worth discussing because they are not they are left out uh, from the current calibration. So, for example, it might be reasonable to assume that um, quantitative easing or quantitative tightening uh, comes in um, in a cross-border positive correlation. Uh, this is exact. I mean, this is the empirical um, uh, our exp experience from from the past decade, and um, it would be interesting to see if one allows for this additional flexibility in which direction do the results go. Um, at the same time, also conventional and unconventional monetary policy shocks may be uh, positively correlated. And that is also one aspect that I think it's worth mentioning and um, discussing the, implica the possible implications. Um, and a separate point it refers to the, to the shape of the, of the reaction, especially when we think about the euro area. You see here um, a decrease of, of the slope, but um, especially given that the model is estimated on, on, uh, on Bund yield, 
it might, might be worth mentioning also the heterogeneity of the impact of, uh, of QE in the euro area uh, across the various, uh, across the core and the periphery countries, because, um, for example, the PEP experience has shown that um, there are also other, other reactions empirical of, empirically of the, um, of the yield curve. So the curve can also um, um, basically shift parallel and um, I think it's, um, it's worth uh, discussing or, or briefly mentioning also that in, um, in your exercise. And um, lastly, um, the last point that I would like to make, it, uh, ref it relates to, um, to the path of uh, QE and, and QT and how do, how do the authors and how is in um, uh, calibrate that versus how it is um, um, implemented uh, de facto by, by policymakers. So um, in, in the model, the QE um, shock is um, amounting to 10% of the euro area of the US GDP. It is unanticipating occurring at time zero and unwinding uh, with the half-life of, of seven years. So um, um, I think that it's, it's the same amount, um, like 10% of, of US GDP that represents also the surprise in the euro area. And that's why I think it's, uh, I mean, I, I wanted to compare that with the initial APP package, which was uh, announced in, um, in January 2015, and that one actually amounted to 12% of the euro area GDP. So um, it's um, a similar overall envelope that um, the authors are considering um, that speaks to the first APP announcement. Yet the profile, as you actually see in, um, in the right-hand side uh, chart, is um, different than um, uh, than the typical, I mean, the way that the authors have implemented in the model. Though, and I'll, uh, so the, the, the yield impact, which you see in the left-hand side chart, um, we find in, in this paper to be similar overall, like uh, so um, decrease of the slope and um, close to 50 basis points for the big four countries. Uh, the profile is um, of conducting QE uh, is, um, is not happening at time zero. So it, there's a gradual buildup of, of the portfolio. And uh, there's also um, um, then the, the unwinding pace may be, may be differently. So concrete comment, would it make a difference if you were to implement a more realistic uh, profile of QE? And how about QT? Uh, we know that QT also in terms of, um, of profile uh, can be uh, different than QE. It's anticipated, the pace of one unwinding is um, um, slightly different. So what will be the implications of the model for the QT phase, which we are? Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Andrea, for the discussion. A lot of smart economists working on yield curve topics, so looking forward to have your questions, please. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for a great presentation and wonderful discussion also. Uh, my name is Claire Thürwächter, I'm from Morgan Stanley Research. Um, and I would have one um, clarifying uh, some, uh, question um, to the, the author. Um, I rem in the initial presentation, you said that there were assumptions on the short-term rates of um, home and foreign to be independent of each other. And I wasn't sure if that um, was then dropped along the way of, of reducing the assumptions. And if it hasn't been dropped, my question to you would be what your thoughts are on like synchronicity and global cycles. We're thinking of your co-author, Helen Ray. I'm sure you have some <laughs> thoughts and discussions on this among yourselves as well. Thank you. Dimitri, is it okay if we collect and then you respond to Andrea and the questions? Okay, good. Very good. And if you need more paper, we have. Please. I think it's quite similar, my question, but I would go a little a step further. So I would expect that if contemporaneously in both countries you have a Q QE, you don't have this incentive for arbitrageurs to purchase the bonds in the other country. So you would have no effects, no spillover. Am I right? And does this affect also then going back to the discussion? If you allow for a positive correlation, then probably 
the effects when only one country do the QE are much stronger than what you obtain. I have um, two questions uh, from remote, from, from colleagues from the ECB. So Alexander Jung is asking uh, on the uh, asymmetry QE versus QT, I mean that already Andrea touched upon, but he also asked about spillovers from forward guidance specifically as a monitor policy tool. So you had conventional and QE and he asked on forward guidance. And our colleague uh, Taneli Mackinen asks, um, can the m uh, model shed light on the relation between exchange rate movements and order flows? Just the first question again. Yeah, so he just, um, so you had conventional policy and QE, and he asked on spillovers from Fed forward guidance. So if you have forward guidance policy, how would you think about the spillover of that okay. specific policy tool? Okay. Maybe one last from the audience, Giacomo? Oh, and another one. Yeah, fine, very good. Yes, just a quick uh, clarification. I mean, from the title of the paper, one <coughs> would be inclined to think that uh, preferred habitat investors play a crucial role. Now, in your explanation, uh, a lot of intuition rests uh, on uh, arbitrageurs. Now, wh what are preferred habitat investors actually doing uh, in, uh, in this world? Let me go back to the yesterday question. So, how much? So, one of the hypotheses is that the investor hedge. So, I'm trying to understand how how much do they really hedge? Okay, how much is relevant this hypothesis? Because, for example, pension funds might be uh, in, so they have to hedge, may well be, but not only investors. So, how much is relevant also when you do the uh, empirical? Uh, the empirical exercise that you don't find so much hedging going on. So I'm trying to understand whether you might dig a little bit, okay, on the different heterogeneity of investor that might well look and search for yields and might well have long-run expectations instead of short-run expectations, okay? So also when I see a QE and I do expect that also the other country is going to do the QE, what am I going to do? So. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. So please, Dimitri. Uh, should I? Uh, well, as you okay. prefer. Yes, thank you. All right. <coughs> so uh, first of all, uh, okay. Big thanks to my to Andrea for her excellent discussion. So I think that it's kind of it's very very good and very constructive. So I think that the number of things that she suggested, the things that we could act, we could actually do, like um, uh, to um, um, kind of, for example look at uh, the effects of QE when QE is um, simultaneous in, the bo in, in both countries or when it's, um, it's kind of correlated with conventional policy and actually this relates to one of the questions and I will say a few more things. Um, or uh, for example we can do this richer, we can get through, go through the, mod get through the model this richer pattern of, Q of QE that is suggesting that kind of is like essentially forward guidance on QE, essentially that QE is a kind of anticipated the, the pattern of, of purchase, we can calculate that. Um, then um, um, the um, anyway, and a few other things that she said. So, uh, yeah. So let me just let me just leave it at that. I mean, I, th I guess on on the data on the I will put also a question mark on the data on the on the big spillovers from the U.S. to U to euro area bond yields of the U.S. conventional policy to euro area bond yields. I guess there one thing that I would like to know and investigate more is whether. Uh, U.S. conventional policy may signal something about expectations about future euro rates and somehow whether this is controlled by the uh, empirical analysis because our model of course is, <laughs> is a theoretical result and it's very stark and says that uh, given that uh, um, taking everything about the path of not only current sh short rate in one country but also the path of expected future short rates to be the same, the, the effect of conventional policy is weak. But I guess the question is what is being held constant. So that's, that's something that I would, I, would, I, I guess, I, I would try to look a bit more in the, in the data. And so that's a, for us to do that, that work. So <clears throat> now on the questions. So very many and very good questions. So uh, on the correlation between short rates, uh, we, okay, yes, the answer to your question is in the, in, the, in the numerical part that I showed you, yes, there we allow for a correlation between short rates and we estimate that actually from the data and actually it's quite high as you say. 
and uh, all these kind of uh, calibrated results are under that assumption. The analytical results that I show you in the main part of the paper are with independent short rates, but this is just to kind of isolate kind of some simple effects. Now, the <coughs> uh, on the contemporaneous QE across countries, I think that you are right, and also this relates to a point by Liliana, that, uh, that, uh, by Andrea, so that uh, the, the, uh, the uh, if it's contemporaneous, there should not be an effect on the foreign currency, and this hedging effect kind of should go away. So whatever effect we get for international spillover should be because of the correlation, the correlation due to the correlation of the short rates. So indeed, it, it may be the case that it's weaker for the... The, the, the spillover effects are the effect of QE at home is going to be stronger than the effect of QE, the spillover effect at foreign. I think that is some, actually for us something to investigate. The uh, order flows and the exchange, exchange rates, yes, that's essentially the model is designed to <laughs> deliver this effect. And um, we have some, actually, even some estimates from, that we, from the literature that uh, on. Um, on uh, what, how big is the effect of order flows and exchange rates that we use to calibrate the model. So the kind of elasticity, yeah. So uh, the, some the, on demand elasticities. But yes, the model is essentially, this is something the, built in the DNA of the model. I mean, it's not something that uh, kind of is very, some very basic feature of the model. Foreign guidance spillovers, okay. So that's, in, there are spillovers of foreign <laughs> of forward guidance. Uh, although now uh, I'm unable to tell you exactly what the direction is, but, um, but yes, I, 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 I can respond to that a bit later, <laughs> maybe. But, uh, but, but there are because essentially foreign forward guidance means that arbitrageurs are going to take some position uh, in, in bonds in order to kind of essentially incorporate their the, the news about ex kind of short rate expectations to, to, to bond yields. And this will generate some, some, some trade also on the foreign currency, but I cannot work it out through on my, uh, on my head. Now, um, the role of preferred habitat investors, what is their role? Um, yeah, so preferred habitat investors, essentially, uh, I talked about them primarily in the context of the demand elasticity that they have. Essentially, I said that arbitrageurs buy bonds. This means that the bond prices go up. This means that preferred habitat investors are selling bond to arbitrageurs. This means that arbitrageurs are finding themselves with a bigger bond position, and therefore they demand um, a higher kind of excess return from the bond carry trade. That's a very kind of, let's say, in some sense, ba rudimentary kind of role of preferred, very primitive, very simple role of preferred habitat investors. But of course, there is another role that I did not really emphasize so much, which is that the preferred habitat investors in principle also generate kind of changes to the demand for bonds. They can have the shocks to their demand, that uh, this, this factor beta that, I, that was in the model, um, which I did not really emphasize very much in the calibration, which kind of make, made this factor fairly simple. But um, this factor might relate these changes to the sho uh, shocks to the demand of preferred habitat investors, which of course are exogenous in the model, I should be very clear, it's just a factor, um, may account, for example, for some of the response, for example, in, of risk premia, uh, that something that uh, Andrea touched on her discussion, that uh, following a monetary uh, loosening, then uh, risk premia, uh, sorry, um, risk premia decline in the, uh, in the euro area, bond risk premia. This might be because this loosening co could cause, a, could this shock to, to R, to the interest rate, to I, can trigger a, a change to the demand, to the demand of, for preferred habitat investors for various reasons. Of course, this is a bit of a black box in our model, but perhaps with some data, one could discipline this. I mean, there, I, there, are, this very, there are some very nice data on investor holdings, and we can try to get, some, some sen uh, try to get a sense of how the, how the demand of preferred habitat investors changes in response to, to, to monetary policy shocks. And then we can say some interesting things about uh, kind of data, basically discipline about, uh, okay, how the effects risk premium. Now, and finally, okay, so uh, Laura's question, how do much do investors hedge? How do arbitrageurs hedge? I guess you want me to, uh, again, that's a bit of an, I mean, hedging is of course important in our model uh, in some, for a number of exercises that we do. Um, I mean, we obs kind of, we observe, for example, that many times, Domestic investors invest in foreign currency, but they hedge this position um, in, sorry, invest in foreign currency, currency instruments, in foreign bonds, but they hedge this position by trading in, in the currency market to get a kind of guaranteed return in, uh, in domestic currency. Now, so there is kind of people who do trade multiple instruments and there, there is some risk management there, but okay, how much? I guess we have to look again at, the, <laughs> at some data to discipline that. Thank you, Dimitri.
And um, so we hand over to Cynthia, another model that has QE in there as a common feature with what we just heard. Please, Cynthia, floor is yours. All right, I will thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is joint work with Ying Shixie from Bank of Canada. In response to COVID-19 crisis, the Fed has doubled its balance sheet to $9 trillion. And for the same period of time, the Treasury has also implemented a sequence of stimulus that includes a paycheck pro uh, protection program, the economic impact payments. And both of the two programs amount to about $800 billion. Now, our research question is, how do we compare all those emergency monitoring and fiscal policy? And we answer this question with a tractable new Keynesian model. In our model, there are two types of households, the constrained household and an unconstrained household. And the financial market is also segmented similar to Dimitri's paper. And we have two types of bonds, a short-term bond and a long-term bond. The financial intermediary uh, plays a maturity trans transformation. They also face a leverage constraint. There are four types of policy instruments in our model. Conventional monetary policy, QE, which is modeled as the central bank's holding of long-term bonds, and two types of fiscal policy, a lump sum transfer to the constrained household, as well as government purchases. So here's a preview of our main result. We compare between QE and fiscal policy, and we find as long as the fiscal policy is tax financed, those three types of policy will have the same aggregate implications. Now, when we compare between those three types of policies and conventional monetary policy, we find the conventional monetary policy is more inflationary. We also dis discuss the redistribution effect, and we find QE and transfers have some redistribution effect whereas conventional monetary policy and government purchases do not. And in our model, regarding equivalence breaks, specifically, we find fiscal policy is more stimulus when it is financed by taxes compared when it's financed by debt. Now, in our paper, we also study some optimal policy coordination, which I will not have time to talk about today. So here's a plan of my talk. I will start with three empirical motivations we would like to speak to with our model. And then I will discuss our linear New Keynesian model and talk about its properties and essentially connect back to the empirical motivations that I start with. And finally, I will talk about the full model behind the linear model and see how it's derived. So let me begin with the empirical motivations. And here, what I'm showing is a breakdown of the federal debt in the United States. The first panel shows the amount of the federal debt that's held by the Federal Reserve in trillions of dollars. Now, before QE starts, it's about half a trillion dollars. And this is after QE 1, 2, and 3, and that's post-COVID. So now it's above $6 trillion. The middle panel shows the amount of federal debt that's held by the US public. So you can see that while the Fed has increasing its holding uh, Dramatically, the amount, of the, U, the amount of the debt that's held by public has also grown a lot. The reason for those two simultaneously happen is because while the Federal Reserve is absorbing the debt at a fast speed, the Treasury has been issuing the debt at a faster speed. Now, here is the, uh, what, what I want to highlight. In the empirical literature, we typically focus on the uh, central bank's balance sheet, which is summarized by the first picture or a variation of it. From this aspect, the empirical literature has argued that QE has been expansionary. Whereas in theory, especially in the theory about a QE, and for example, that includes a work by Gerler Karate and my own work, in those theoretical models, they show that we should focus on the joint balance sheet between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. And specifically, if we look at the middle panel, which is the total amount of the debt that's held by the public, the conclusion from the theory would be the balance sheet policy since the Great Recession would have been contractionary. So the question I would like to raise here is, does the empirical literature miss a dominant piece 
this part? Or does the rapid debt growth of the treasury not matter in theory? So that's a question we would like to address with our model, and I will come back to it. The second empirical motivation is about fiscal multiplier. So I would like to highlight two parts. The first part is the estimates of the fiscal multiplier is a range. So specifically, I'm quoting the survey article by Valerie Ramey in JEP. And in her table, she summarized those estimates from various papers. And the range is between 0.3 and 0.8. And the second part I would like to highlight is the fiscal multiplier is state dependent. And specifically, I would like to highlight the dependence on the financing method. So here I list two papers. The first paper uses microdata and finds that when the government finances expenditure by debt, it crowds out private loans and consequently reduce the multiplier. Now, the mechanism in our model works precise like how she describes in her empirical studies. The second paper uses cross-country evidence to show that multiplier is smaller in countries with higher debt to GDP ratio. The third aspect I would like to talk about is transfers, and I would like to highlight two parts. The first is the aggregate implication of transfers. And here's a sequence of paper they find the US government stimulus package during recessions increased household spending. And the second part is about the distribution consequences. And uh, this paper find the responses are larger for poor household with lower wealth and income. So now those are the three empirical motivations. And now let's talk about the linear models, its properties, and how we connect back to the empirical motivations. So I will start with the textbook version of New Keynesian model with the IS curve and the Phillips curve. Y is output. I is the one period nominal interest rate. Pi is inflation. The headed variables are log deviation from the steady state. And we have the IS curve on the top that summarizes the demand side of the economy, and the Phillips curve at the bottom that summarizes the supply side of the economy. The parameters here are all standard. Sigma is the inverse of intertemporal substitu uh, elasticity of substitution. Beta is a discount factor. Now, in a typical model, we just summarize those two parameters together, and that's a slope of the Phillips curve. And this one additional parameter that captures the steady state shear of the unconstrained household's consumption in output. Now, in a standard model, all the households are unconstrained. So this parameter is just one, and it drops out. Here's our model. I use the blue terms to highlight the new components. So you can see the additional policy includes QE, transfers, and government spending and they in enter both the IS curve and the Phillips curve. Now, how do they work? QE works by relaxing the financial con uh, intermediary's leverage constraint. So that allow the constrained household to borrow more, which allow them to consume more. And as a result, it stimulates aggregate demand. Transfer works similarly. It hands out checks to the constrained household, so they are able to consume more. And as a result, it also stimulates aggregate demand. Now, one key parameter I want to highlight here is a parameter eta. This parameter captures a fraction of fiscal policy that's financed by taxes. It's between 0 and 1, and 1 minus eta is a fraction of fiscal policy that's financed by debt. So here's the first result. Now, in the literature, typically, we either study QE or study fiscal policy, but typically, we study them separately. So our paper makes the effort to bridge them together, and we find the effects of QE and tax finance, the fiscal policy, whether it's government spending or transfers, have the same aggregate implications. Now, if you like to look at the equation, here's how we get the conclusion. We impose eta equals 1. That means all the fiscal policy is financed by taxes. And in this case, you can see QE transfers, government spending enters the equations all the, in the same manner and in three different locations. 
and I want to highlight all of them enter both into the demand side of the economy as well as the supply side of the economy. Now the second result is about inflation. We compare those four different types of policies and we show that to provide the same amount of stimulus, conventional monetary policy is more inflationary compared to QE and fiscal policy. And this result is consistent with the literature. For example, in my RESTAT paper, we make a similar comparison between conventional monetary policy and QE, although that paper doesn't have the fiscal policy. Now there's also some empirical literature show that physical policy is not inflation, not that inflationary. Now in our follow-up work, we also look into more directly into the empirical implication of the model result in terms of inflation. And the preliminary result supports this claim. Now, why is conventional monetary policy different? Because you can see all four types of policy could be stimulative, that's because they all enter into the IS curve. But that's not the case for the Phillips curve. Conventional monetary policy does not enter into the Phillips curve, whereas the other three types do. And you can see if there's an expansionary QE transfer or government spending, what it does is it puts downward pressure on the flips curve. So this is an active sign. Now, I'm not saying that those policies are deflationary. What I'm claiming is that there's this additional downward pressure through the supply channel on top of the, uh, the uh, inflationary channel through the, demand ch uh, through the demand channel, which is in the standard model. So why this, why this happens, why there's a downward pressure? Because those policy crowd out the consumption of unconstrained household. So those households have to go out to work more, which puts downward pressure on wage, and that put, puts downward pressure on prices. So now we can speak to the 2021-2022 inflation surge with our very uh, uh, simple model. At that period, before the inflation takes off, the logic order of the Fed tightening would be to unwind the balance sheet first and then raise the policy rate. But what actually happened in response to the high inflation is the Fed raised the policy rate from the zero lower bound to over 5%. And during the same period of time, they barely winded down the balance sheet. Now, this is actually consistent with our model prediction such that tightening the policy rate is more effective in lowering inflation compared to uh, the uh, quantitative tightening. For the same period of time, the physical authority has provided another round of stimulative. What they do is they hand out checks and to help uh, households to alleviate from the increased cost of living. So for example, in late 2022, 17 states have done so. Now, our model implication of the combination of the two policies, the tightening of conventional monetary policy, the rate hike, together with expansionary physical policy, together have the potential to lower inflation but does not cause a major contraction. Now we can talk about redistribution. In our model, QE and tax finance the transfers have this redistribution effect and it goes from the unconstrained household to the constrained household. Whereas the other two types of policy, the conventional monetary policy and tax finance government spending do not have such a channel. Why that's the case? Well, QE and transfers, they both work to relax the constrained household's budget constraints, so the constrained household is able to consume more. So the resource redistributes from unconstrained households to the constrained households. Whereas for the policy rate and government spending, although both of them could provide the aggregate stimulus, they do not go through the constrained households. Now we can go back to the empirical motivation in terms of transfers and two of our propositions, the proposition one and this proposition three, speak to the uh, empirical results. And proposition one says the transfers are not neutral, 
not like in a typical standard rep re representative aging nucleansian model. And Proposition 3 says the transfer redistribute wealth from unconstrained household to the constrained house, and both, both of them are consistent with MPROCO findings. Now, so far, all the fiscal policy are ba uh, the discussion based on tax finance fiscal policy. What happens when the fiscal policy is financed by debt? We show that once the fiscal policy is financed by debt, it doesn't have any aggregate effects. Now again, to see that, let's look at the IS curves and the Phillips curve. When we impose eta to be zero, those gray terms drops out. So transfers and government spending no longer enter into the two equations, only QE does. Now, what's the intuition? Transfers and government spending themselves are expansionary. But at the same time, when the government needs to finance them, they issue long-term bonds. The fact that they issue long-term bonds itself is contractionary. Now, in our very stylized model, those two effects just counter each other out and the, uh, there's a zero net result. So now we can speak to the empirical motivation about the balance sheet policy. When we talk about the balance sheet policy, the question is, should we worry about when the treasury is issuing long-term bonds as the opposite effect of QE? Now, based on this result, when the government issuing long-term bonds, there is a contractionary effect. However, this contractionary effect is countered by the expansionary effect of government spending transfers. So those two effects are canceled out, especially in this very simple model. So consequently, what's remaining is a central bank's balance sheet. So essentially what our model does is supports the practice in empirical literature that we should primarily focus on the Federal Reserve's action and not worry so much about the Treasury issuing long-term bonds. Now let's talk about the recording equivalence. In our model, recording equivalence breaks because tax finance is different from debt financed. Specifically, when a larger fraction of physical policy is tax financed, government expenditure transfers are more stimulative. So again, the same equation, the IS curve. The key parameter is this eta. So in this equation, when eta is larger, that means we have more, uh, more physical policy that's financed by taxes, it is more stimulative. So what matters is not total amount of transfers or government spending, but it is a total amount of transfers and government spending that is financed by taxes. And protocol motivation on the physical multiplier. So I described earlier, in the data, the fiscal multiplier has a range between 0.3 and 0.8. Now, in our model, this is still a range. If you look at the y-axis of the graph, it's between 0 and 0.72. So in a very simple model and standard calibration, we're able to generate a reasonable range uh, in the model. And also, I want to highlight the state dependency in terms of uh, this picture that the physical multiplier is an increasing function of eta, and eta is the fraction of physical policy that's financed by taxes. So the more of the physical policy that's financed by taxes, the more effective they are. And both of those results are consistent with the empirical findings. All right, so now I describe the linear model, the properties, and discuss how they relate to the empirical motivations I started with. Now let's see what is the machinery behind the linear model and how do we start from the first principles to get those IS curves and Phillips curves. In the background, there are six different sectors. There are two kinds of households, unconstrained household and constrained household. The unconstrained household is pretty much standard. They save via this short-term debt instrument. It's a deposit. We call it the deposits, and they pay taxes. Now, the constrained household is relatively non-standard. What they do in our model is they issue long-term bonds to finance their consumption, and they also receive transfers from the government. 
the financial intermediaries stay between the constrained household and unconstrained household, and they perform maturity transformation. At the same time, they face a leverage constraint. The firms are totally standard where they, do, uh, they face a cover sticky price and the central bank implements two types of monetary policy, QE and conventional monetary policy. The government implements two types of physical policy. They make transfers to the constrained household and they make purchases. And they finance their spendings by either tax the unconstrained household or issue long-term bonds. Now the, uh, the unconstrained household. Their standard, they maximize their utility and they get utility from consumption and they get disutility from labor supply. They're budget constrained. They can consume or they can save with this deposit going from T to T plus one. So it's one period nominal saving vehicle. On the income side, they, th that's the income from wage. And those are total proceeds of the deposit from last period, and that just captures all the uh, dividends and transfers and taxes. First order conditions are standard. The first, the first first order condition captures the labor supply condition, and the second one is the older equation, which, uh, which is uh, a function of the uh, nominal short-term interest rate here. Constrained household. In our model, the constrained household does not work. And the reason we, we assume they don't work is for tractability alone. And to get the IS curve and Phillips curve, we need to make some assumptions. Now, we do robustness check uh, numerically when we're assuming they work in the appendix as well. They're less patient than an unconstrained household. So equi in equilibrium, the constrained households are borrowers, whereas unconstrained households are lenders. The constrained household finance its consumption by issuing long-term bond. Now, the reason we call them constrained, I had to put a quote here, is for the following. First, the constrained household's borrowing is limited because of the leverage constraint that the bank sector is facing. So put it differently, the constraint is not literally on the constrained household themselves, and their older equation still holds but the constraint is transferred from the banking sector. Now, another reason we call them the constrained household is because although structured differently, but they, in terms of certain aspects, for example, transfers, they behave similar to the hand-to-mouth household in the tank model. That's probably what you have in mind in terms of the constrained household, although they are not exactly hand-to-mouth in our model. So those are the constrained household. They maximize their utility only over consumption, and the discount factor beta is smaller than the discount factor of the unconstrained household. So this makes the constrained household the borrower. They're budget constrained. They consume. Now that's a total coupon payment of the debt they issued previously. The new debt issuance days period. Those are the transfers from unconstrained household and from the government. And they also have this first order condition, the older equation. Now, the difference between this older equation and unconstrained households older equation are the two folds. First, the discount factor is different. And two, this older equation is used to price the long-term bonds. So RT plus one is a holding period return of long-term bonds from T to T plus one. So essentially, we can imagine the unconstrained household is pricing the short-term bonds, whereas constrained household is pricing the long-term bond. So that's a market segmentation in the model. Now, between the two types of households is this financial intermediary. Financial intermediary lives for one period. Again, this is a tractability assumption uh, that's similar to my previous paper, and we need this assumption to reduce the system down, but it does not really change the quantitative result of the model much. Their balance sheet condition, they can hold long-term bonds, they can hold the reserves issued by the central bank, and they can fund their holding through deposits and their own net worth. 
and their own net worth has two parts. One is a new uh, equity injection from the household, and the second part is essentially coming from the fact we assume the financial intermediary only live for one period, so they are inheriting the uh, wealth from the previous intermediary that exited previous period. Now, the key thing here is a leverage constraint. So the amount of the long-term bond the intermediary can hold is smaller than or equal to a factor of their own net worth. Financial intermediary maximize the dividends uh, discount, discounted by the unconstrained household's stock is a discount factor and subject to the leverage constraint. So here are the two first order conditions. For the first one, omega is a Lagrangian multiplier on the leverage constraint. So what that means? When the leverage constraint binds, which is a relevant case in our model, in that case, omega is positive. Omega is positive means that the return of holding long-term bonds is higher than return of holding the short-term bonds. So this is how we generate a positive yield curve in these types of models. And this is essentially how QE works in the model. QE works by relaxes the financial intermediary's leverage constraint, which flatten the yield curve, and then transmit into the real economy through the consumption or the constraint of the constrained household. Now the second first order condition is a standard. What that sa says is essentially that without any friction between the reserves and deposits, Holding one period deposit is the same as holding one period reserves. They give you the same return because both of them are short-term uh, instruments and there's no risk either way. The central bank. The central bank implements a standard Taylor rule. Their balance sheet condition, they, they can hold long-term bonds and they finance their long-term bonds with reserves. And we define QE as a real quantity of long-term bonds they're holding. And uh, Q is a price and B is a real quantity. And the central bank returns surplus. Now it could return surplus to the fiscal authority or the households and their equivalent just like uh, the only difference is how the math shows up. Physical authority. What does the physical authority do? They can make transfers, they can spend, they have to pay off the coupons from the bonds they issued previously. Now on the income side, they issue new bonds and that's tax income. The tax revenue, we break them down into two terms. The first term is the key term we want to capture in the model, which is it a fraction of the total transfers and government spending. The second term we add here, which has an interpretation of the in the literature for fiscal responsibility. So essentially the fiscal authority have to tax a fraction of the debt previously to make the system sustainable. And for the reason we need to have this additional term is so that the uh, nonlinear model has a unique solution in the equilibrium. And the, to guarantee the uniqueness, we need the following condition which is purely technical reason for our model. The equilibrium conditions. The goods market clears such that the output can be consumed by unconstrained household, constrained household, and the government. The asset market clears such that the bond could be issued by the government, the constrained household, which can be held by either financial intermediary or the central bank. Now we have made some additional assumptions to reduce to, for the system to be able to reduce, and that's the last one. We make additional what we call convenience assumption, and that's the assumption on the transfer between the unconstrained household to the constrained household. As a result of this assumption, the constrained households Consumption depends on QE, transfers, now again transfers, and government spending. So the system has a total of 24 equations and 24 unknowns, and with some algebra, we're able to reduce it down to the IS curve and Phillips curve. 
Now, after describing the full model, we can talk about additional uh, transmission mechanism and additional intuitions. First, I want to compare between QE government spendings and the transfers. So let's start with the constrained household consumption. And we're based the discussion on the tax finance, so eta equals one. And in this case, you can see that the constrained household consumption depends on QE and transfers, but not government study, uh, government spending. How do they work? QE allows a constrained household to increase their consumption because they are allowed to issue more bonds. Transfer works similarly. The household, the constrained households receive this additional check, which allow them to consume more. So because both of those two policies work through the constrained household and they have a distribution effect. Now here's the aggregate resource constraint. Unlike the constrained household consumption, here we have both QE and transfers, but also the government spending. So government spending enters the aggregate resource constraint the same way as QE and the same way as transfers. So the takeaway here is those three types of uh, policy have the same aggregate effect, but they have different redistribution effect. And the reason is because government spending, although it enters into the aggregate resource constraint, it does not enter into, it does not affect the constrained household. So that sets apart between the other two policies and government spending, although in aggregate, they look similar. Finally, I will talk about the breakdown of the Ricardian equivalents. So when the physical policy is financed by debt, which means eta equals a zero. Now in this case, you can see that only QE affects the aggregate resource constraint and both government spending and transfers dropped out. So that means debt finance physical policy have no aggregate implications. Now why this happens? Physical policy itself is stimulative. But on the flip side, when the government needs to finance those physical policy by issuing bonds, the issuing bonds part is contractionary in our model. Now, why is contractionary? Because the total amount of the bond demand is exogenous. And that's dictated by the leverage constraint of the financial intermediary, as well as QE. When those are decided, the government issue bonds. As a result, it crowd out the private sector so the constrained household are not allowed to issue the amount of bonds they want. And it lower the consumption of the constrained household, which is contractionary. And in our model, because it's a very simple, simple model, the two parts of the effects just cancel out. So the net effect is government spending and transfers drop out. So to conclude, we propose a tractable model that features four types of government policy. And we show that QE and tax finance, the physical policy, have the same aggregate effects. Now compare with those three types of policies, conventional monetary policy is more inflationary. Among the four types of policies, QE and transfers have a redistribution effect, whereas conventional monetary policy and government spending do not. And in our model, recording equivalence breaks. And in our paper, we also discuss implications for optimal uh, coordinated policies. So our model reconciles with four, with the three empirical motivations I, I started my uh, talk with. The first one is that the balance sheet policy should be summarized by the central bank's bond holding, and that's a practice in empirical literature, and that's what our model suggests as well. And two, we show that physical multiplier depends on the financing method, and as a result, it could be a range instead of just a simple number. And the final one is that transfers are both stimulative and have redistribution effects. And thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks.
that extends the scope to also the fiscal dimension. I see a couple of colleagues from the fiscal uh, division here also, so good to cover everything. Stefan, please. Great. <clears throat> Many thanks first uh, to the organizer for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Uh, because it is after something which I think is extremely relevant, uh, namely to update the baseline UK engine model to the recognition that the Great Moderation ended some 15 years ago now. Because this baseline UK engine model was really the model of the Great Moderation. And it embeds some of the reality and also of the policy consensus of the time. Number one, monetary policy is better suited than fiscal policy for stabilization purposes, and number two, uh, monetary policy is implemented through uh, control of the short-term interest rate. Now, uh, the Great Moderation ended in 2008 because, you know, stuff happened, uh, and when facts change, uh, as Keynes said, we should change our two-equation model, but we haven't really. Um, so what should we add really to this model if we want to take into account what we've learned in the past 15 years? First, of course, we need to add the importance of financial intermediation and a role for quantitative easing. This is actually something that Cynthia already did in a paper with Eric Sims, 2021. Uh, they embedded QE in this two equation model. But something else that we learn, if not starting in 2008, at least 2011, and especially in the past six, seven years, is the importance of household heterogeneity, which creates a role for fiscal transfers. And this is what Cynthia is doing here uh, with Yingxi. They're gonna keep QE and also add a role for household heterogeneity and fiscal transfers. So obviously, if you want to fit into two equation uh, QE, financial intermediation, household heterogeneity, and fiscal transfers, that's starting to be a lot to put into two equations. But the clever thing that Cynthia and Yingxi realize is that actually the Sims Wu paper is already a tank model. It's already a model with uh, a saving household and a borrowing household. Uh, you can think of it basically as a Gertler uh, uh, Karadi model. Instead, that the firm this time is a household that borrows uh, its consumption from the financial intermediary. Uh, so if you want to add fiscal transfer, you just need to add fiscal transfer here. There's nothing else that you need to add to get uh, the household heterogeneity part. So you can sum up the past 15 years of macro research in two equations, but that's actually an understatement because uh, there are also new lessons from the paper that you will not necessarily find in either the quantitative easing literature or the household heterogeneity literature. So for instance, first, uh, for the same effect on aggregate demand, QE, transfer, and uh, government spending are less inflationary uh, than conventional interest rate policy. That's not something that has been so much emphasized in either literature. Uh, number two, quantitative easing and transfer redistribute from savers to, to borrowers' households, but not government spending and conventional interest rate policy. Um, the first part is kind of intuitive, but the second one uh, is actually quite at odds with the uh, household heterogeneity literature, so it's already uh, uh, new and also a bit thought-provoking. And third, uh, debt finance government spending is less stimulative than tax finance government spending. Your system one brain might be thinking, oh, sure, I know this from ISLM, but notice it is not the same thing. It's actually the opposite from the ISLM result, and that comes from a new eviction result from the leverage concern of the financial intermediaries. Okay, so uh, in such a model, obviously, you need to make a lot of simplifying assumption, so I'm not going to ask for a second illiquid asset, irreversible investment, and the like. Instead, I just want to point at some assumption that I think are unnecessarily strong, uh, but matter for the result, and that could be relaxed without losing much uh, on tractability. All right. Comment number one is about maybe embedding more of the insight from the Hank literature into the model. Because right now the model kind of superimposes two interpretations uh, of its model. The first one is interpreting this borrowing household as basically a proxy for firms in a full-fledged gertler karadi model. And this is kind of the interpretation in the previous paper on QE only. Uh, but now that there is transfers to constrained household, it also wants to uh, talk about this household as like the hand-to-mass constrained household of a tank model. This is not a problem in itself, of course, but right now it implies that it makes some assumptions that abstract from some important channel that have been emphasized in the Hank literature. Uh, the main assumption I have in mind here is the assumption that the constrained household doesn't have labor or capital income. Its only income is coming from a transfer from the other household or from the government if the government wants to do a transfer. And that's kind of important because the Hank literature has emphasized the importance of indirect income channel in the transmission of either monetary 
of fiscal policy. So it's going to matter, for instance, it matters for result number two that uh, conventional interest rate policy don't have distributive effect and they don't affect the consumption of the constrained households. Uh, the Hank literature has emphasized and said that it can have, even conventional interest rate policy can have a uh, large distributive effect and it can affect even constrained households uh, through indirect um, income channels. So the main one would be the Keynesian cross, but there is also uh, Adrien Auclair interest rate exposure channel, the Fisher debt def deflation channel. This is for theory, but empirically, the empirical Hank literature has also found that those mechanisms are very strong in the data. There are several papers that do this. Here, I just picked the one with the most dramatic picture. This is from uh, Anna Rogantini Pinko here at the ECB and her co authors, based on Swedish data. And you see, for instance, for labor and income uh, at, the, at the top here, that you have a very heterogeneous response of labor and income, in particular, that uh, the response of the labor and income of the bottom income distribution is quite strong. So you can think of those income maybe as the constrained households of a tank, and the, the impact of monetary policy is actually even stronger on them because of those indirect income channels. So incorporating those indirect income channels uh, would be uh, something super useful. Second reason why it matters is for the result number three that the tax finance government spending multiplier is um, uh, sorry, is uh, larger than the debt finance government spending uh, multiplier. And here it kind of matters because um, the ISLM argument for the opposite result is precisely very much based on the Keynesian cross on, those, the, on all those indirect income channels. Uh, obviously there is a new channel here in the model, but precisely because they go in opposite direction, that would be useful to have both uh, in the same model to see how they interact and which one end up being uh, the strongest. Okay, comment number two, I'm gonna work backwards, back to uh, result number one on uh, the inflationary effect of QE and transfer. So the result here is that quantitative easing and transfer uh, have a less inflationary effect than conventional interest rate policy. And this comes in the model from the fact that uh, the households that work are the saver households. So that if for the same level of aggregate demand, uh, you have a transfer from uh, the unconstrained to the constrained household, the unconstrained household is going to feel poorer, it's going to be willing to work more, this is going to put downward pressure on the wage, on marginal cost, and this is going to put deflationary pressure. Uh, this is a meaningful channel, but um, its sign may depend on the assumption that only the saver household uh, is actually working and is on its labor supply Curve. So here I just generalize the labor supply schedule of the model to the assumption that both households work and they can work by different amount depending on their disutility of working. And you can see that the new term, which is the one that depends on the consumption gap, uh, depends on the sign of this blue term here. And this term can be either positive or negative uh, depending on uh, the differential disutility of work of the two here. So if you want to have the result of the paper that a smaller consumption gap uh, decreases marginal cost, it needs to be the case that savers work a higher share of work than they consume, um, that, than their share in aggregate consumption. Uh, under the QE interpretation of the model, that's reasonable, but if we want to think of those constrained households as the hand to mouth household of a tank, maybe the opposite assumption is equally plausible. Um, so that would be useful to just try to tie that to empirical evidence on uh, the, the strengths of this um, income effect. So for instance, the typical worry during the transfer in the US during uh, COVID was that those transfer to, um, to households were uh, necessary, but that they could have put um, uh, upward pressure on wages because, because they had had transfer, they would be less willing to work. So this is not empirical evidence, it's just a worry, uh, but it highlights that it's a theoretically possible channel, so it would be useful to have some empirical backing on the sign of this channel. Okay, comment number three, uh, I'm going to go back on the eviction effects. So there is this, uh, this cool new eviction effect in the model uh, that implies that debt finance fiscal policy uh, is actually fully neutral. This is in part due a bit to the formulation of the full bailout from the unconstrained household, but mostly it comes from the leverage constraint of uh, financial intermediaries. So the story is the following. Imagine I'm a constrained household and the government sends me a check of 1,000 euro. Uh, but it's going to finance that by issuing a new government debt. Now the financial intermediary is going to have to buy this debt 
And because it is constrained, it's going to have to reduce private lending by 1,000 euros. I am the private sector, I borrow, so in the end, for me, it's a complete wash. I don't increase my consumption. That's meaningful, but like the complete eviction result may depend uh, quite a lot on the assumption that public debt weighs as much as private debt in the constraint of those financial intermediaries. And that's a bit of a strong assumption, and it can be, I think, easily relaxed. For instance, just doing the same thing as in Gertler and Carady, in which they assume that public debt does weight on the balance sheet of those financial intermediaries, but less than public debt. Uh, in a Gertler Carady model, it would be because it's easier to monitor uh, the government for which you have a lot of information than a private lender. And Douglas Diamond yesterday uh, made a similar kind of argument that uh, it's not the same to, uh, to, to, to buy government debt and to uh, finance the private economy um, by doing real banking activity. And doing so should downsize the eviction effect uh, that Cynthia and Yixi uh, are emphasizing. The empirical reason uh, for maybe enlarging this is that empirically, um, so we've seen obviously a massive uh, increase in um, the federal debt in the US, and also, as Cynthia mentioned it in her talk, uh, in the size of public debt held by uh, domestic, um, uh, by domestic uh, households. So here in blue, I'm plotting federal debt minus what's held uh, at the Fed and minus what is held abroad. It did increase, but in terms of, um, in terms of intermediation spreads, those are the IC Bank of America spreads in red and green, we didn't see such a, an increase in those spreads and they are basically back to where they were uh, before, even though uh, public debt is now higher. This is just the same thing for the euro area. Let me just skip that uh, to move to comment number four, uh, final comment, which I'm going to start from, that, from just an extreme version of the previous argument, um, which is that there is one view on this gertler carady channel of quantitative easing, which is that it only works in times of financial stress. Uh, this is something that is a bit present in Gertler Karadi 2013 already, which is definitely very present in Kurdia Woodfall 2011. And Peter and Anton have a recent paper, 2021, in which they make this, this argument and look at this argument in much more detail. The idea here is that in normal times, the leverage constraint of financial intermediaries are not necessarily binding, so that you would go back to uh, the QE irrelevance result. For this paper, that would mean that obviously quantitative easing would be neutral, but also some of the fiscal policy implication uh, would be uh, different depending on whether we are in financial stress time or not. Now, this is not the end of the argument, though, because even if this one channel of QE doesn't work as much uh, in normal times, it doesn't mean that other channels cannot be at play. So, for instance, QE could alternatively work through uh, what Dimitri uh, just presented, uh, a model of portfolio balancing and duration extraction. To be sure, Dimitri's model is also a model about uh, limited arbitrage, but it is quite different from a gertler carity thing. It's not that the central bank is stepping in and doing the job of financial intermediaries in its stead. Uh, alternatively, QE in normal times could work through the signaling channel, uh, obviously, and since we are in the euro area, it could also work in part by affecting self-fulfilling expectations of sovereign default. Uh, that's, for instance, uh, a recent paper by Bank of Spain economists, Costain, Nuno, and Thomas. And here again, that's quite a different channel. It's not that the central bank is taking risk away from the balance sheet of financial intermediaries. It is that it's just eliminating this risk altogether from the economy. So uh, I'm starting to be willing to uh, you know, put a bit too much uh, into just two equations, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, but you know, even this slide is just a tribute to, uh, the, to the paper and the objective of Cynthia and Yingxi in this paper, which is really to update this baseline model to uh, what has happened in the past 15 years, and I think that they are on a very good track to doing so. Thanks a lot, Stefan. <laughs> okay for you, we try now to collect first questions from we try to collect first questions from the audience, like last time. Please. Yes, Pa. Please say your name first. Many people know you, but maybe not all online. So. Yeah, thank you. Jesper Linde from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, very interesting uh, paper and uh, discussion also by Stefan, I thought. You know, I just wanted to first sort of make one comment and, and two questions. The comment is that I think it's sort of well known from Woodford's baseline model say that the 
uh, inflation output gap elasticity is the same for uh, monetary and fiscal policy, right? You, you, if you take the Woodfordian model, you engineer um, you know, mo through monetary policy or fiscal policy an alternative output gap path, you're going to get the same transmission on inflation. So that's going to be the same. But it's going to differ for fiscal now if you go to the, what you do, Cynthia, you know, and, and Stefan talked about inflation output elasticity you now because fiscal policy also has effect on potential output. So that's going to lower the effectiveness of fiscal relative to short-term policy if you talk about the inflation output elasticity. So I, I, in a sense, I just wanted to, I think it's, uh, your result is well known there. The comment is then, then you said on slide 32 that you're going to have in your model that you do debt finance fiscal stimulus or consolidation, you have basically no inflation effects. But I wanted to have your thought on how that relates to evidence now because, I mean, in reality, of course, all fiscal stimulus that we measure, I guess, has debt effects now and they do not have zero zero multipliers. So I wanted to have your thoughts on that. Then I just wanted to have your thoughts on, um, because you have no endogenous labor, if you allow for endogenous labor, how do you think about the inequality effects of fiscal and monetary in, in a case where you allow for endogenous labor? Thanks. Leo. Uh, Leo von Tadden from the ECB. Uh, I found this paper super interesting. Um, but still, given that we here are at a central bank, I have a very simple question, namely, what exactly, if you bring your findings at some point also to optimal policy cho choices, what is the motivation of QE? Uh, and, and when do we need it? M my understanding is, you know, and you stressed this a couple of times, QE has very strong distributional uh, implications. But for this, alternatively, you could also do it through something that is more conventional from a fiscal perspective transfers, for example. While you said, uh, as long as we talk about inflation issues, controllability of inflation, you use uh, the conventional short-term rate. Now, my question now, I think, is the following. You have not mentioned the term lower bound. I mean, the way QE came into praxis, practice is because uh, many central banks had the feeling they were constrained by the lower bound, so they had to think about something else. But in these, uh, complicated circumstances, then of course QE has a double task, right? Because for, foremost, it has, we needed to, to stimulate inflation, knowing that it may not be first best, you would like to do it through the conventional channel. Um, while if you do not talk about the lower bound, I would say we can essentially stick to standard assignments. There is no need then to go so strictly for QE. We have, you know, fiscal policy makers do their job, taking care of our distributional concerns. Central banks do their job controlling inflation. I see no other questions. So, Cynthia, if you can reconcile within two minutes, that would be excellent. Yep. Uh, thanks very much for the discussion and all the questions. Uh, so let me respond to Stefan's questions first. Uh, so yes, we make some stark assumptions in order to reduce the system down. And specifically for the assumption about uh, the constrained household does not work. So we have sort of like the way we answer in a paper is we put it in appendix where we assume the constrained household also work, but also obviously that's given the parameterization or calibration in our paper. And in that sense, quantitative result does not change. Now, if we change the calibration, as you mentioned, it might change. Now, the way we think about this, like where we started is from the QE literature. So essentially, we model the constrained household as a uh, shortcut to model the uh, firm sector without getting involved in capital accumulation and investment. So in that sense, like we didn't model it were, uh, uh, the, the constrained household to work. Um, the, the second question is, so you are saying that uh, the short-term interest rate does not affect the constrained household. Now, this assumption is actually coming from the market segmentation in our model. So in our model, the uh, unconstrained household it have access to the uh, short-term interest rate, whereas the constrained household has access to those long-term bonds. So this is how they break down, like the short-term interest rate does not affect the uh, constrained household. Now, in principle, because of the yield curve, there could be transmission from the short-term interest rate to the long-term interest rate through the yield curve. And 
Uh, it could be the case in a simplified model that's shut down, but in general, there is a spillover, but it's just not as much as a uh, standard model you would imagine because those two interest rates are the same, right? The spillover, the beta is a smaller than one from the short term to the long term interest rate, which is consistent with the empirical data. Um, so that's why there is a breakdown. Um, the next question you are saying is the inflation. So the result on the inflation depends on the, how we model the constrained household, right? So that goes back to whether the constrained household work or not again. So we try to indirectly tackle this question by a follow-up paper by looking to empirically, is there an active sign to on the, uh, the, the Phillips curve and what is the general equilibrium effect of a different types of policies, right? Is the conventional monetary policy work the same as QE, as transfers in terms of the aggregates and in terms of the supply side? So we're trying to answer this question, not from justifying like our assumption, but trying to see if our results actually make any uh, empirical sense uh, consistent with the data. Um, and your point about the government uh, debt and the private debt, uh, uh, we, yes, in, in a big model, you could, model them differently and we thought about modeling them but just for simplicity we dropped them but I think we could add them and it might it might still be able to reduce to the equations we have but now with the delta floating around with eta right so I think that would be the change so the math should work out yes it's a stark assumption that because in the the difference between the government bond and the private bond in the Gerler karate framework, as well as my, in my previous uh, model in the medium scale, the difference is quite mechanical. It's just the scaling effect as you write down as a delta. So we didn't think there's anything that's more intriguing there. That's why we drop it, but just also for simplicity, we could look into like uh, investigating more. Um, oh, one last comment. Uh, you were saying for the leverage constraint only binds for the extreme periods, but for, not for normal time. Actually, I think that the reason we assume it binds for both times is if we think about in the steady state, right? On average, the yield curve is spreading up, right? There's a positive spread between the long-term interest rate and the short-term interest rate on average in the data, right? In this model, if we assume the leverage constraint doesn't bind for normal times, and if we only assume the zero lower bound is occasionally binding, then the spread will be zero. So in order to make that be empirically relevant to generate a positive slope of the yield curve on average, we basically need the assumption of the leverage constraint to be binding. Now, it could be something else, it could be other friction, right? But that's one friction generate the slope. So in our model, I think it makes sense to always have it binding and QE will always be relevant. Now, whether the central bank wants to implement QE during normal times, that's a different question, but it should be always uh, relevant. Now, going back to the question by Jasper, um, so you were mentioning about the relationship between inflation and output gap. Uh, in this model, the, uh, the coefficient between the inflation and marginal cost is the same as in the standard model. But the elasticity between inflation and output is different for QE. So we actually discussed that in, in our RESTAT paper. Um, and you were commenting on the debt financing, whether the uh, multiplier should be zero literally. Now, in general, it's not zero, right? And we, all, we did that uh, quantitative exercise by relaxing some assumptions, but in general, in, uh, e even we relax all the additional assumptions we make to reduce the system down, the key takeaway is debt financing is less stimulative compared to tax finance in our models, that is consistent. Now, whether it's literally zero, I don't think so, like once you take away some of the assumptions, and also this result is consistent with the empirical findings of the paper. Uh, one of the paper I cited, uh, the micro study paper, and she actually finds that uh, the tax finance is la has a smaller uh, output uh, multiplier, so that's consistent. Now, whether it's a literal zero, it's a, it's a like uh, artificial fact of the small scale model. Uh, indulgence labor, I think I talked about that. And the question from Leo, the optimal choice. So both the optimal, 
We discussed the optimal policy in a paper. I just didn't have time to mention it. So in the optimal policy, we derive the welfare function. It's depending on not just the output gap and inflation var variance, but also depends on uh, cross-sectional consumption variance. So it does depend on this welfare function of the uh, distribution between the different kind of households. And uh, um, so we, we talk about that. We can talk more about the results. And zero lower bound, we did the zero lower bound in the restat paper and precisely because like QE is a, a, zero, a result of the zero lower bound. Now it just involves more math and the qualitative result is the same except for we cannot implement conventional monetary policy so, so we have to do QE to uh, counter some part of it. So that it, that's why we didn't do it in this paper but we did some of the analysis in that paper. Excellent. Thank so you. please join me in thanking again Dimitri, Andrea, Cynthia, and Stefan for this excellent seminar. Thank you. Now, um, we are going to bridge science and practice even more intensely uh, in almost uh, only 10 minutes in the policy panel. So we're looking forward to it. The coffee break is very short, so please be back in time at quarter to 12. Thank you. <laughs>